now take your seat at the head table and I also invite General Kamal Gunaratna and Professor Rohan Gunaratna to take your seats. Today's session is moderated by Professor Rohan Gunaratna, the Director General of Institute of National Security Studies. Sir, it is my honor to introduce you. Professor Rohan Gunaratna is an honorary professor at General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. He is a senior advisor to its Faculty of Defense and Strategic Studies, a former senior fellow. At the United States Military Academy at West Point, he received his PhD from St. Andrews University, where he was a British Chevening Scholar. A specialist in national security, he received the General Van Diemen Award for Intelligence Cooperation. Dear sir, the microphone is over to you now. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, to spark uh, the discussion, the Q&A session, I would like to say that uh, Dr. Swami moved between the past and the future. So if we look at the oldest age we had was a stone age. From the stone age we went to the agriculture age and then to the industrial age and to the information age. You're talking of the digital age and that will dawn in 2030, that is in nine years time. So what I would like to say is that he has spoken very much about the future. But I would like you to engage him both on his trajectory of the future, but also of the past and the present. And in order to do so, I want to share something with you that we learned a few minutes ago. As the Secretary of Defense, General Gunaratna said, Dr. Swami steadfastly supported Sri Lanka when we had very few friends. In fact, I would place him in the, tra in the trajectory of history with Richard Amitage from the United States who supported us and then Lord Naseby from the United Kingdom that supported us. You supported us from India. So in history, you have a special place and that is why you are our honored guest today and the Secretary of Defense will correct me if I'm wrong since we moved to our new headquarters you are the first international dignitary to make a formal presentation am I right Mr. Secretary so I want to tell you that we are people of deep history and gratitude so we tri pay tribute to you for helping us at a moment when we had few friends beyond our shores. With that quick introduction, I also want to share with you that he helped us at a time when he faced many threats. Today we learned that Prabhakaran had placed Rajiv Gandhi on his death list, but Prabhakaran also placed Dr. Swami on his death list. In fact, of the LTT key supporters in India, there was V. Gopalasamy, there was Nedumaran, and there was Seaman. And Gopalasamy himself told you about the threat. So to spark this discussion, I would like you very quickly to mention within a minute about what Gopalasamy told you. given a task by the then Prime Minister, Mr. Chandrasekhar, to make an assessment of what's really going on in Tamil Nadu. Because we had received intelligence report that uh, Mr. Karunanidhi was planning for a secession announcement. And uh, the LTT, which he had fully supported, um, judged by the fact that uh, most of the petrol pumps which were sanctioned by the ministry during the time DMK was part of the central government which we brought down which is headed by VP Singh 
and uh, which is also the uh, uh, the government which um, legitimized LTT to a great extent. Uh, there, Mr. Karunani, these uh, people were part of the cabinet of that government. And uh, we also got intelligence to say that Mr. Karunanidhi had been briefing a man called Baby Subramaniam. I don't know whether you know him by name here. And uh, anything the center sent to him by way of information, uh, he would then uh, pass it on. Uh, not only petrol pumps were being given freely to the LTT to take diesel and oil, petrol and all for the war effort against the IPKF, uh, also, our hospitals were in Tamil Nadu opened to the injured of LTT to be treated in that. So he asked me to do, give him a report. I gave him a report after going there that there's no alternative except to dismiss the government under Article 356 uh, of the Constitution. And uh, for that, we needed a report uh, which was signed by the governor. Mr. Barnala was at that, that time. So this task was given to me. I took it to Barnala to take, give us, get his signature. Uh, Mr. Barnala was in, called to Delhi, and there I met him in the, in the Tamil Nadu house and, uh, in Delhi and asked him to sign it uh, because I said I have verified it. There is nothing much to think. This is a dangerous time. We have to... This is what Article 352 was set up for, put into the Constitution. But he declined. He said, I can't do that, because Mr. Karunanidhi appointed me as the governor. And I'm, I'm loyal to him. That's a very strange thing to say, but that's what he said. Now, that put us in difficulty for those who didn't know the law. So when, I, when Mr. Prime Minister came to know Chan Shekhar, he told me, what is this? He has not resigned. Now we can't do it. So I said, no, the Constitution says that uh, on a report uh, signed by the governor or otherwise, a word which never had been noticed by anybody except me, because it is put <laughs> in the Constitution and nobody reads every word. So otherwise means without even the governor's signature. So I took it to Mr. Vengatraman, who was then the uh, president of India. First he resisted signing, uh, but then uh, ultimately I persuaded him and he signed it. And we dismissed the government. Now, before dismissing the government, the Cabinet Committee on Political Affairs uh, had met, which is well, the Prime Minister, myself, and the Deputy Prime Minister, plus all the Army Chiefs and IB Chiefs and uh, Intelligence Bureau Chiefs, etc. And they all said unanimously that if you dismiss the government now, there will be rivers of blood, and there will be immediately a declaration of independence, and foreign powers will step in to support it. So uh, I'm telling you all this because it's in this background that Mr. Prabhakaran paid a heavy price. So what happened then was that uh, uh, the Prime Minister left it totally to me, and uh, Rajiv Gandhi was also supporting us, so Rajiv Gandhi said, I have full faith. I give it to him. And so I went and parked myself in Madras. And uh, of course, uh, I called the DG police, etc. We took some steps, which meant that after the dismissal of the government, leave alone uh, rivers of blood, leave alone buses burning, even cycles were not burnt. And people came out in jubilation, celebrating the dismissal. And uh, subsequently, we had held elections, and out of 234 seats, only two seats were won by DMK. That bad it was. So I'm, uh, that is what led to what he is referring to about Vaiko. So Vaiko, I was a member of parliament at that time, and I had just finished uh, presenting a bill. I was also a law minister besides being commerce minister, so I, there was a bill I had to pass. I came out in the lobby. He stopped me and he said, I have a message from somebody called Tambi. So I didn't know that was the usual name for Prabhakaran. Did you know that? Oh, yes. Okay. So I, he said, Tambi. I said, who is Tambi? So he told me Prabhakaran. I said, oh, him? He said, yes, he has a message 
that you are uh, you are uh, on his hit list and you will be killed like there was some defense minister of yours who was killed in some automobile accident or something uh, Vijay Ratane, Ranjan Vijay. He says, like him, you will also die. So I laughed. So he asked me, why are you laughing? So I said, you see, if Prabhakar has got me on his hit list, what makes me laugh is that I also have a hit list and he's number one in my hit list. <laughs> so, therefore, uh, let's see who goes first. And thanks to you people, he went first. <laughs> I mean, you people mean him and <laughs> so this was a lesson. And then after that, there's hardly any LTT except underground, some poster or something. <laughs> but there's no no LTT in Tamil Nadu. Of course, there was a di diabolical assassination on this, which uh, I have shared with you something. Uh, but that's uh, unless I have a I'm in command of the government or I'm in an important position in the government, I won't be able to prove it, so I won't say it. Maybe in dinner you can ask me, I'll tell you. But Prabhakar's uh, uh, assassination of uh, Rajiv Gandhi, uh, I also can say that uh, Chandra Hassan gave us a great tip on Raj Rajiv Gandhi's assassination, the sense after the assassination, we couldn't figure out who did it because they had worked out the propaganda so beautifully, they, she was just in a uh, dress in uh, Salwar Kameez. So the Sikhs have killed him because of what happened in October uh, uh, 1984 and so on. And uh, ultimately, uh, 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 Sandra Hassan told me that uh, Mr. Prabhakaran had addressed a public meeting in uh, Jaffna on 10th of June after the assassination and given a medal to some Raja Ratnam poet whom nobody had heard of. So I, I, nobody knew, and I, entire Intelligence Bureau of India, RAW, none of them knew who Raja Ratnam was. So I asked Chandra Asan, and he said, only thing I know about him is that he was a poet, but his daughter was the leader of the Tamil Tigresses. And then we got a photograph and identified it. So uh, that extent to which it was planned, but it uh, unfortunately didn't work. And then, of course, LTT was banned and the people have been put in jail. Dr. Swami, you have been very well briefed by the Indian services because the killer of uh, Rajiv Gandhi was a woman called Tenmuli Rajaratnam. Ah. Her LTT name is Danu. She trained in the seventh batch in India, uh -huh. in Tindugal. Uh -huh. As you know, the <laughs> first batch was trained in Himachal Pradesh, oh. in Chakrata. Yes, Chakrata. Second batch in him, uh, first batch was in Uttar Pradesh. Second batch in Himachal Pradesh. Eight other batches, including the seventh batch, the training was in Tamil Nadu. But we thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, questions for Dr. Swami. Yes. Well, I feel from my knowledge of history that the closest allies should be both democratic countries or both dictatorships. In the case of uh, Russia and China, uh, now it is widely accepted in the strategic world that Russia is a junior partner of China. And, uh, and the reason is that uh, China had given huge amount of loans to the Russians, and the Russians, uh, you know, find uh, China ideologically 
uh, not very different, although they are, uh, they are not formally declared as a communist country, but Putin was a, uh, was a KGB agent. Uh, we all know that. So uh, India and Sri Lanka, if we are pitted against some other country which wants to be friends with you, first of all, there should be no conflict. You can be friends with both. Um, and uh, uh, you can be friends with uh, not only two, but you can be with ten. And uh, since uh, uh, Sri Lanka doesn't threaten anybody, so therefore that, should, that problem should not be there. But as a democracy in India, I think uh, we, owe, we, owe, we need to uh, take the view that uh, Sri Lanka is situated in a very strategic area. If tomorrow Sri Lanka, India, in Andaman Islands and uh, Malacca, a strait is controlled with the help of the Indonesians, then you are uh, a mighty power yourselves because of the fact that the Chinese commercial traffic to Europe comes all through, 90% comes through the uh, Malacca Strait. And Malacca Strait is like uh, an undeveloped Suez Canal. And you can uh, develop it to a point where you can control who goes through, who doesn't go through. So. Um, I would therefore say that uh, there, are, there are some issues which need to be worked out, and that is the cultural one of bureaucrats thinking that small countries can be pushed around. And I found this problem not only with Sri Lanka, but I found it with Nepal too. And um, I think this, uh, that is something we will address in our country and uh, I think we have now a mounting problem with the Chinese. It's uh, very near war, and there could be a war. The probability is much higher than a war in Taiwan, certainly, uh, between China and Taiwan. So um, in that, a lot of new changes will come. But at the moment, I will say that uh, Sri Lanka has got a raw deal from India since your new government came and it is being sought to be corrected now. And uh, I hope uh, the correction takes it to its full limit. Therefore, you can repeat that question just once more so that we can hear clearly. That's okay, we can hear it. Use the mic. Sir, am I audible, sir? Yes. Uh, this is with related to uh, now, human security is part of national security. So the human security always runs on four things. That is universalism, then the prevention, the other thing is interdependency, and people-centered. So the, my, my question is revolves around interdependency. Because when the interdependency starts, the sovereignty of that particular country, whether it is a, a lower, lower income country or middle income country, will be threatened. So with your vast experience and knowledge, what are the strategies that you recommend to overcome such fluid situations for uh, so those countries? Thank you, sir. You know, in this uh, last century, uh, so some countries have unraveled. The Soviet Union broke up into 16 countries. Yugoslavia broke into four, uh, and uh, Pakistan broke into uh, two. Um, a small part of Indonesia also broke away. But uh, the much predicted uh, balkanization of India did not take place. In fact, uh, 
Um, right from day one, uh, Ch Churchill predicted three years, three years passed after 1947. Uh, Nixon said it will be the decade of the 1970s. Well, decade of 1970s, uh, Nixon was impeached, but uh, not India. Uh, and India survived. He said it will break into 20 countries. And this prediction has gone on, but India has disproved all of them. What is the interdependency that is there in India is a common understanding of the historical origins of our country, and in which uh, now we are bolstering it with the knowledge of DNA studies, the, uh, uh, the journals of, uh, of uh, um, uh, you know, biology and biometrics and so on, they all are saying that Indian DNA is the same whether it is in South India, or North India, East India, or West India. And we accept on the fringe, on the border with China, where there's some mixture, but even there the dominant uh, genes are that of Indians. There is no difference between the genetics or the DNA of a Brahmin, Kshatriyas, and all these, these are not birth-based anyway, even in our, in our, uh, in our scriptures, say like Gita, Bhagavad Gita, it's very clearly said that uh, this Varna system is not birth-based. Krishna himself says so. Now, you are asking what way you can bring this interdependency, this mythology which has been spread by imperialists in the past. In our country, it was all the British which spread all this rubbish about Aryans and Dravidians. There's no such thing. No one came from outside. We have no, and even the world uh, scholars now are beginning to give up the idea of some migration that came to India were, who were Aryans and that they drove the Dravidians, the ruling Dravidians down to the south. Dravid is in fact a Sanskrit word used by Adi Shankara for the first time, meaning Travid, which means where the three oceans meet. There's the Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal, and Indian Ocean. So uh, we, the Aryan Dravidian theory has been demolished, that uh, Bra Brahmins, Kshatriyas, and all, they are of different, uh, thing, uh, different uh, races, uh, rubbish, not been, been disproved totally by the DNA studies. And it's not even by family. It is uh, by choice of the uh, the job uh, the, or the choice of the career that you choose. If you are a jnani, tyagi, and a, and a nirbhai, or that is, if you are knowledgeable, uh, if you are a sacrificer, if you sacrifice the worldly wealth, and uh, you have you are courageous, then you qualify to be Brahmin. Who says that? Krishna himself says that in the Gita, in three different chapters of the Gita. But uh, we think it's birth. A, a, a Brahmin born of a Brahmin is a Brahmin, no. Or a, a scheduled caste born of a scheduled caste, no. Valmiki was in fact born in a scheduled caste family who wrote the Ramayana. And he, be, he became a Rishi. How is that? Because, and same thing with the, uh, Veda Vyasa who, was, who wrote the Mahabharat. He, he uh, was born of a fisherwoman. And he rose to be a great rishi and wrote the uh, Bhagavad, uh, the Mahabharata. So I think uh, the the wrong notions that we have acquired. I'm talking in the context of India and Sri Lanka only. Uh, I, I I don't I can't say anything about Russia and all. I haven't studied those. But India and China and Sri Lanka suffer from the history that was written for us by the British authors. And that was a project which uh, Macaulay said in the Parliament of Britain, in, in, in England in uh, 1935, 1935, called the Minute on Education for India, where he said that my, our idea is to create differences and to bring, uh, to uh, degrade the culture of uh, India and make them into uh, brown Englishman. I mean, English in habits, English in dress, English in uh, eating, uh, eating uh, choice of, uh, you know, how you use with a fork of knife or you use your hand. All this is described by, uh, by Macaulay. So, 
purge all these history books and write what is correct. Do it by scholars. The politicians can't do this. Get scholars, eminent scholars, put them together and have where you write the correct history. I'm not saying do a propaganda in that, but write the correct history. The correct history will remove these interdependency differences and we'll be much stronger. But let me again add, these are, there's no defensive mechanism uh, except post attack by a cyber, a cyber weapon. I mean, you can't prepare for a war uh, unless, uh, you know, unless you know what the war is. If a cyber attack takes place, we can make sure, for example, in Mumbai, the cyber attack took place, we never knew, because we now know, because the Chinese themselves have admitted to doing it, and it's a, as a warning. So now we will ensure that we have alternative um, uh, technologies to go into uh, activation upon such an attack. So uh, those things we can do, but you have to now be cyber technology savvy to survive as a nation. Otherwise you will be at the mercy of those who are. And some countries have already got a lead, but fortunately Sri Lankans and, Tamil and, the, and the Indians, they uh, have demonstrated all the world that um, software, electronics, all these things are you know, natural for them. And uh, if artificial intelligence needs Sanskrit, it means that we must have got it in our DNA itself. So I don't think that this 21st century security should worry you at all, because we are potentially able to develop a system which is superior to everybody else. Doctor, you can introduce yourself. Okay. Um, I'm Tessara Jayavala from the University of Muratua, uh, and I'm head of the Department of Industrial Management. Yes, uh, as you mentioned, the 21st century national uh, security is threatened by uh, digital warfare as well as biological warfare. So one may say that uh, governments should employ uh, people with digital knowledge and uh, more skills. But how do we escape the this system. I will uh, go further with my question, like because you know, cyber world is really uncontrollable, and somebody might suggest that enforcing criminal justice to cry, uh, cyber crimes would be the way forward. Or maybe you may, in your speeches, I have seen that awareness among people or building a digital awareness among the community is the correct way of moving forward. Uh, since you mentioned prior that about democracy, I was thinking, you know, somebody always says that autocracy is the proper way to, uh, you know, deal with uh, cyber crime since democracy is not prob probably, um, you know, facing the challenges. Uh, but then, uh, you know, China is not really undermining the democracy of other countries. In fact, they have offered to uh, provide the cyber tools to control the safety, so if I may, you know, just to, but in India and Sri Lanka, we don't necessarily ban websites or arrest people. We try to find, find subtle ways of using our powers, even though our defense secretary has proposed some, uh, you know, strict measures to control these cyber uh, crimes. We are still not doing that, even if we do. Uh, when you look at the recent example of Israel and so uh, that, uh, you know, how uh, India and Hungary has been, um, sold some cyber security software to control the, uh, you know, the, the voice of the opponents and yeah, the journalists. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, with, with all those in mind, do you think, you know, cyber security and moving forward, should it be an autocracy way of doing it or can we do it with our democratic <laughs> way of handling it? Yeah. Well, very good question. Uh, the top one. I think... Uh, uh, cyber security is one which is no respecter of either democracy or dictatorships. They cause damage. And in my opinion, uh, 
democracies are better because the dissemination of information to deal with a post cyber attack uh, is much easier because in uh, dictatorships they may consider imparting such knowledge as dangerous to their autocracy uh, so uh, i don't think that democracy is at as a disadvantage in fact all research you and you are in uh, centrally in the field of research is uh, advanced when a lot of people discuss c contradict criticize write journal articles uh, so it's only in a democracy that you can do it and uh, the, uh, and therefore i don't i think i will say the opposite that cyber warfare we can have of course uh, cyber warfare protocols uh, international protocols you can do this do that. if you are going to do a cyber attack you have to give an advance warning all that you can have international relations uh, i mean international uh, codes for this and anyone else who the whole world will gang up against as you know as an outcast so therefore uh, uh, that you can but still the mere fact that a, where it originates from unless the country owns up to it like the chinese you will not know you won't even know if the terrorists got hold of it it's possible that a country develops it and then it falls to the terrorists like if afghanistan had developed and taliban took it the you know taliban would played havoc with it so uh, more important is first of all the knowledge what cyber warfare means and reorient your educational system because that takes itself 20 years to produce uh, a system where the people are become savvy they are knowledgeable and uh, they are able to um, articulate you know the atomic energy also when you if you look at the newspapers of that time of the 1940s you know, we shocked at how people thought that you know the end of the world has come and japan thought the end of the world has come when nagasaki and uh, Hiroshima had been uh, bombed. So, but then over a period of time, uh, we developed uh, uh, rules, and then uh, slowly, the, it's no more such a monster as it was before. So, this also should be subject to education, and uh, education development is, in my opinion, the most important part today for the future. Yes, General Robert. one of the most important topics today which i have been putting up in this country since 2013 even when i went to follow the national defense college course the thing that i wrote was a role of sri lankan military in combating future cyber threat oh. because having fought a war for 30 years we have very well identified that the next wave of terrorism would hit sri lanka in the cyber domain but uh, with the uh, defense secretary we have worked out so many things for the defense as well as for the rest of the nation but my question is always there had been sort of di dilemmas civilian versus military law enforcement agencies versus intelligence communities so when it comes to the cyber security or cyber warfare naturally somebody might think oh okay that is the role of the military military should fight that as well but military cannot uh, fight a cyber war with uh, uh, rockets uh, yeah, and so whatever it is so uh, in your opinion what would be the role of the future militaries in combating cyber warfare yes. and uh, how cyber security should be incorporated into the national security policy as well and again i feel uh, when it comes to the laws which are prevailing at this moment do not support this whatever the crime so whatever the things what would take place in the cyber domain so what are your recommendations for that because there has to be so much of interrelationships sure. amongst sure. countries thank you i'm told your president uh, was a mommy man before so, so at least sri lanka couldn't have any complaints about <laughs> about lack of uh, uh, you know excuse me uh, lack of coordination between uh, uh, um, between the army and uh, the civilians but 
Ordinarily speaking, I think uh, the civil society should be educated uh, in the essentials of the army. That's why in India we created something called NCC, uh, National Cadet Corps, where students went and lived in mil military camps, uh, you know, did uh, rifle shooting and, uh, you know, uh, marksmanship and uh, climbing on ropes and so on, uh, all these uh, 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 things. But in uh, military itself has become now so much cyber uh, dependent that I don't see any uh, conflict in this unless there is a, um, a civil servant who is just uh, uh, thinks it's a waste of time. There are people like that in uh, many occasions. We find that in our country uh, because they think that uh, basically law and order, that is all that is important and managing the finances is important. So that kind of uh, thing, but that's, uh, that's uh, the more the exception than the rule. As far as I can see, the way things are going, the way the knowledge is spreading, uh, people are reading, young children are looking at computers and they are able to understand, they tell me much more about science than uh, I knew at their age. And so I, I see no difficulty in making the transition to the new uh, cyber age. And I, Sri Lanka, has now an advantage. You, it's no more uh, a, a, a handicap to be a small island uh, relative to, say, the big countries. Uh, because cyber warfare, you'll be all equal. And therefore, you, uh, you have a new program to give, uh, um, uh, give maximum focus to cy cyber studies. Uh, I'm sure that uh, some committee can be set up and you can do it and decide, and uh, Sri Lanka would be in the f forefront with the others or, since we are already on software and uh, and uh, in these matters uh, we're pretty far ahead. Let's go for the last question. Uh, Commodore Damien Fernando uh, from Sri Lanka Navy. I'm the Commandant of Naval and Maritime Academy. So thank you very much uh, for your insightful thoughts. So when it comes to the national security, of course, you know, it determines the national power. When uh, in the 21st century, in t a contemporary world, it's determined by four factors. One is your diplomacy power and the information, of course, the cyber you have talked uh, to a greater extent, and the military might, of course, it will stand on. Then the last one is economic. So uh, we have seen that since the... Uh, uh, Indian Ocean has been contested platform in 21st century. So there are a few words in the global arena. Uh, one thing is dead trap diplomacy, the crisis. Since being a small state, how, with your colossal experience, how do you how do you how do you uh, uh, propose us to tackle this uh, a lawful approaches, which? finally determine uh, your, your uh, national policies. So please comment, sir. Well, interesting question of yours, but uh, let me say first of all, uh, for long years, economists thought that capital and labor, and land of course, but land is a limited commodity, so it soon went out of the equation, but labor and capital, these are the two factors of production. And uh, everybody, you see newspapers even today talking about, uh, you know, so much money has been allocated, so much and so on. But as economists, I can tell you, as far back as 1957, we economists had come to the conclusion that whether it's the United States or whether it's Japan, or whether it's the European developed countries, all developed due to the fact that 60% is attributable to new innovations introduced in the economy. Today, for example, you can desalinate water, so the rivers going dry has no meaning, strictly speaking. I, I don't say that you should deliberately uh, make the rivers go to go dry. 
by because uh, uh, rivers have been become a part of our civilization. However, many of the things Mar, uh, Mar, uh, there was a uh, uh, economist called Reverend Malthus, who said that uh, the rate at which population is growing and the rate at which food is growing, uh, the rate of food is much lower than the rate of growth of population and soon we'll be eating each other up. This was his prediction in a book and he was a reverend. What happened? The rate of population for every country in the beginning of, of development rises and then reaches a peak and then starts going down. Today, what is the problem in Greece and what is the problem in most of Europe? They have a very small uh, birth rate and therefore they have to get these um, uh, migrants from abroad and then they are having social problems like in, in, uh, in, in France. So the, um, as prosperity increases, it's an economic law that people have less and less children. And uh, China tried to accelerate that to take it to the other extreme, now they're regretting it. But as a consequence what is happening that every developed country is becoming an aging population country. Take Japan, where the, uh, where the um, uh, average number of people who are above the age of, uh, above the age of 50, uh, 25, 25 uh, the average age of Japan is 50 years. On the average, the Japanese is 50 years. India is only 25. Because the number of children produced by Japanese is, you know, one and two like that. But the Indians produce three, four easily. So, therefore, uh, let us understand that even economy, it's the innovations which drive the economy. And that is what Sri Lanka is eminently capable of. And in an environment where it doesn't matter if you are big or small. With a small number of uh, cyber weapons, you can devastate the whole of China or the whole of the United States. So, therefore, uh, uh, what, if at all, if China wants, if uh, Sri Lanka wants to work with any country, it must work with a country which is, uh, which they are able to interact in the same way that they interact amongst themselves. So, democratic countries are the obvious choices. For, for getting together. Uh, you may have relations with other countries, but in terms of closeness, it has to be or collaboration. It has to be people who think alike or have a similar history, similar background, and overcome all the, uh, the divisions that have been artificially created. As I gave you the example of caste in India, it's a total north-south, totally rubbish. There's no such thing as a Dravidian race. Dravid is a geographical term. This is what I, I would like to say. Thank you, Dr. Swami. My colleague uh, Charani will now uh, bring us to uh, the final item on the agenda. Thank you very much, sir. First and foremost, I have to thank our guest speaker for delivering an eclectic presentation and also for the audience for raising important contemporary question and entertaining us. That was truly thought provoking. Ladies and gentlemen, now it is the time to deliver the mementos. Director General of INSS, Professor Rohan Gunaratna, will be now presenting a memento on behalf of the Institute of National Security Studies, to Honorable Dr. Subramaniam Swami for honoring the invitation and delivering an eclectic presentation. Perfect. 
and now it is the moment of presenting another token of appreciation by the Revenge Chair, General Kamal Gunaratna, WWV, RWP, RSP, USP, NDC, PSC, MPhil. To our Honorable Dr. Subramaniam Swami, on behalf of the Ministry of Defense and State Ministry of National Security and Disaster Management and the Tri Forces. Dear sir, you have another very special gift from our secretary, sir. You will be awarded with his precious book, Rotan Andhikadal, and also the book of Gotabaya, as a token of appreciation for visiting the premises. 